So welcome everyone to the Curator Artist Talk for Landscapes of Material and Mind, uh, which is my virtual background right now. And uh, we have here nine artists from the exhibition, as well as our uh, partner at the museum, Marsha Rudy, and our curator, Tara Rhoda. I'm so glad you all could join us here today. We are recording this event in case um, you came in late or uh, have to leave early or want to share this with anyone else who you think might be interested. Um, my name is Julia, I'm the director of SciArt and I'll be kind of running things along today, but really we're here to hear from the artists. Uh, we do have time for questions at the end of the event um, in about an hour. So if you have any questions, um, the best way to uh, get them asked is to drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Now, inevitably, some people will drop it in the chat. That's fine too, I will find them there. But if you can, please try and use the Q&A box just to keep things organized. And I'll comb through them and try and get to as many as possible. You can ask questions to specific artists or to the group as a whole. Um, okay, so let me get my screen share going. If you are in New York or if you're in the New York area, um, wow, those show dates are wrong. The show is up until April 24th. Uh, so please feel free to drop by the wonderful New York Hall of Science in Queens. You can take the seven train right out there. It's a straight shot and visit the exhibit in person. Um, so I wanna hand this over to Marsha. Uh, to talk a little bit about the museum and uh, what you all do there and um, maybe a bit about the exhibit and whatever else you want to say. Welcome everyone. It's so glad, so great to see so many of the artists actually in person because I have memorized who they are by their work. <laughs> of course, it's very different from seeing you as a real person. Um, the shot you're looking at is the introduction to the exhibition. We have waited for this for so long because of COVID. And then of course we had a situation where Hurricane Ida um, flooded a large part of our museum with $14 million in damage. Fortunately, the space where landscapes of material and mind was going to be displayed was not affected. But we finally were able to open the exhibition February 19th. Um, and as Julia mentioned, it will go through April 24th. Um, the museum is now open Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Um, we normally would be open seven days a week, but you can imagine because of COVID, um, the groups that would be coming to us during the week, um, the school groups, of course, have not been doing field trips. So we're just opening one or two of the days, depending on how many are now aware that they can make a reservation and feel free to come here. But we are a hands-on science technology museum. Um, we have entertained Sci Art Initiative now for a few years with the juried exhibitions. And I'm really so thrilled that we could finally have this exhibition on display. Um, I'm very impressed with a lot of your work as is um, many of our visitors. Uh, when I've been at the museum, I kind of watch people and they really are looking intently at the works, even reading the artist statements. So that's really joyful to know that maybe this is the first time people have seen anything related to art and science and with a particular topic. So I hope that many of you will come to the museum. Um, let me know if you are interested um, and I can facilitate your, you know, vi your visit. So we have a lot of other exhibitions on display. Many of them have been changed from hands-on to more um, touchless, <laughs> you can imagine, but people really like to engage in as many different ways, brains on, hands on, or anything else. So I'm looking forward to hearing about every one of your works today. Awesome, thank you, Marcia. Um, as Marcia mentioned, uh, the New York Hall of Science has been one of our exhibit partners for a number of years now. Um, if you're new to SciArt, one thing that we do on an annual basis is host art exhibitions. Um, 
that deal with a uh, culturally relevant theme in science or technology. Um, and the idea of landscapes, you know, landscapes art historically, that tradition goes back literally forever, um, as, as far back in art history as you can go. Um, but uh, of course, our exhibit has a scientific and technological twist on it. Um, we have another, uh, a number of other programs. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can visit our website, sireinitiative.org. Um, and if you are interested in the New York Hall of Science, uh, you can find them at nysci.org. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Tara Rhoda, our lovely uh, guest curator. One thing we love to do at SciArt is bring in other perspectives. And um, Tara, uh, I will let her kind of fully introduce herself, but she's somebody that I've known for a number of years now. And it was such a pleasure to uh, get your perspective on this topic. Great, thank you, Julia. Um, and thank you for working with me, Marsha. It was wonderful to be invited to curate the show um, and, and see it come to life uh, at the museum. Uh, but like Julia mentioned, uh, my name is Tara Rhoda. I'm an artist and an educator based in New York City. And I run the SVAA uh, School of Visual Art Bio Lab, um, which is coming up on 10 years of uh, working with artists and giving them the, the toolbox of science uh, to use in their own studio practices. So you can see the space behind me. Um, but this is uh, was a really great opportunity to be able to uh, curate um, an exhibition. And um, I, I've always, in terms of uh, the, the concept, we, we went through a few different iterations, but ultimately it comes back to this threshold of inside and outside. Um, and a lot of our artists address that in different ways. But um, <clears throat> I've always been fascinated by the, the psychological framework of the, the contained self, um, this idea that we're separate from the, the world around us. So when I was considering different themes for the show, I kept coming back to this notion of what is inside versus what is outside and just how many aspects of life that permeates and shapes. Um, so with this inherent and relentless threshold of otherness framing so much of how we understand and relate to the world, I think it's fair to say our, our basic reality is somewhat characterized by this construct of, of separateness and, and even governed by the, the vital comfort and, and instinct to perceive the, the self as contained. Um, so this question of where we end and the rest of the world begins is a curious and sometimes uh, slippery one. Um, the general public's response to headlines such as, you are more microbial than you are human, sort of demonstrate this unease. Um, and maybe Joseph, Francois Joseph will tell us a little bit more about that later. But um, from every angle, whether it's environmental, political, emotional, um, unwanted exposure counters deliberate connections, um, a constant force of, of push and pull uh, from inside the body to the great outdoors from the level of bacteria to that of the psychological, how tangled are the landscapes we are composed of and live within? And this was the question that we really posed to the artists that contributed. Um, the artwork in the exhibition explores these questions from the personal, scientific, metaphorical, and artistic points of view. Um, and it was uh, quite a variety of perspectives. So thank you to all the artists that contributed. Thank you, Tara. Um, that's a great introduction to, uh, to the work that we're gonna see here. So not all of the artists could join us here today, unfortunately, um, but we have 10 really fantastic um, artists from this exhibition. So we are now going to hear from them a bit. Give one or two more images. These are images of the show. First up, we have uh, Rainy. Hello. Um, thanks so much for putting this show together at, at, at long last. And I'm really honored to be included in this show with so many amazing other artists and really looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say about their work. I'm also honored that one of my images is sort of served as the cover image for this show. So um, I'm happy to talk about uh, this project. 
Um, my name is Rami Newell and I am an artist. I work in um, lens-based media, so both in photography and in filmmaking, documentary film and experimental film. I'm based in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia in Canada, and I also teach at the University of British Columbia for filmmaking. Um, in my artistic practice, I like to explore themes relating to ecology, climate change, deep time, scientific epistemologies, human non-human relations, mythologies of the American West, and also documentary image and its expectations. Uh, in this series, Manifest Obscura, I sort of combine all of those thematic interests into this layered exploration of landscapes of the American West. Uh, the series consists of five images, which are usually printed at about six feet wide. They're huge prints, but for this show, for the logistical reasons, they're a bit smaller. Um, but uh, the way that I created them was uh, that they're, they're just simple pinhole images taken with a pinhole camera and four by five uh, color slide film. And I collect uh, biological samples from the landscape that I'm photographing, and I take those with me back to my studio. Um, I then coat the um, slide negative, well, it's positive actually, I, I, I coat the slide film with a, a special nutrient coating, and then I seed that coating with the biological material that I collected from the site. Uh, the microbes that are inside that, um, those biological samples then grow through that nutrient coating and into the emulsion of the film itself. And that's what creates all of these incredible patterns that you see here. Um, so in this series, I'm looking to sort of complicate that art historical um, sort of reference to the American landscape uh, that you were talking about earlier, right? So I'm not the first to image these landscapes, but I am in conversation with that, that art historical understanding and rendering of the American landscape. So the soft sort of dreamlike images that you get through a pinhole camera sort of immediately frustrate our um, sort of desire, art historical desire to fetishize, fetishize nature as sort of this, you know, detailed and sublime landscape that is really key to that art historical rendering of the American landscape. So um, the precision that you would get with a finely detailed oil painting from the Hudson River School, for example, here is, um, totally issued in favor of ambiguity, right? It becomes fuzzy and sort of dreamlike. So that's sort of the first level that I'm playing with there. The titles of the, of the images are, they sort of hint at specificity of these landscapes and I've appropriated them from settler and scientific explorer journals from a time of westward expansion that violently subjugated both human and non-human beings in the American West and sort of rendered the landscape as this um, you know, endlessly exploitable profusion of resources instead of as this complicated ecosystem that it is um, and that we depend upon. Uh, so in this case, like language, just like image, right? Sort of fails to inscribe the landscape completely. And this failure of inscription and the shortcomings of our understanding as humans uh, is also indicated by that biological process at play. So those microbes, who are asserting their own image basically in place of the image that we might try to make of the landscape around us. They're reconfiguring minerals and chemicals to further obscure this you know, image world that, that we think we know, right? So these forces that we can't see, these in, you know, tiny microscopic forces that we can't see, which inhabit both the landscape around us and that we inhabit and also our own bodies like was all, already mentioned. So sort of blurring that line again, between interior and exterior and obfuscating through the tools of scientific epistemology, using those as a tool of obfuscation to confuse our understanding of the world around us is part of the goal of this work. Um, and I work with scientists often, and I did collaborate with some scientists um, to develop this process as well. And, and I sort of played with these ideas of co-opting those tools of science uh, for opposite or I guess complementary purposes, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so I'm questioning the limits of, of scientific epistemologies here as well um, as looking to sort of collapse these temporal and spatial scales in a way that sort of um, unsettles our understanding of the landscape. Thank you so much, Ramey. Um, I'll just flash through. Oops. 
both images again so you can see them again. Again, if the audience out there has any questions for any of our artists as we go along, please drop them in the Q&A chat box and we will get to as many at the end as we have time for. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Francois Joseph. Hello, yes, so thank you, Remy, for such a nice introduction. I'm also from Canada, but on the other side, I'm, I'm based in Montreal. Uh, thanks for having me on this show, Julia, Marsha, Tara. Uh, as you said, Tara, uh, recent studies have shown that we are not only composed of human cells. Some studies show that at least 50% of the cells in our bodies are bacterial cells. So the so-called microbiome or human microbiome is the collection of bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, yeast, and other microorganisms that are living on us, around us, and inside of us. As a biologist, I am interested in the microbiome to characterize its diversity in different environments. As an artist, I track the changes in my bacterial identity through different types of performances. And the three pieces that are uh, part of this show, uh, these three artworks are three different landscapes of the bacteria collected from the palm of my right hand uh, during a performance uh, during which I shook hands with 1,000 persons. So that was way before COVID-19. It's impossible to do right now. So these pieces are part of a larger series of 20, what I call quote unquote, microbiome selfies, depicting the changing landscape of microbes living in my hand as I give and take microbes from strangers uh, with whom I shake hands. You can read these images as social networks for bacteria uh, because these are in fact networks. These uh, digital images are uh, designed using exactly the same um, um, visualization tools that I uh, use to characterize biological networks. So the nodes are representing different strains of bacteria and these bacteria are connected with each other uh, based on their genetic relatedness. So the different clusters that, that you see represent different families of bacteria and the different colors are associated with different layers corresponding on the numbers of handshakes. So the three microbiome selfies that uh, are part of this show uh, are based on the 1000 handshake performance and they, and they represent the microbial diversity after this one is 300 handshakes. Uh, the, the previous one, uh, Julia, no, this one is 1000 handshake and the, the, the reddish one is uh, 650 handshakes. Um, by doing so, I try to illustrate the, my interactions and how the interactions that I have with strangers is actually shaping my bacterial identity. So this is for me. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer after the talk. Thank you so much. Just scroll through these again. Next up, we have Laura Stack. Hello. Am I on? You are. We can okay. hear you loud and okay. clear. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone at <clears throat> the New York Hall of Science, Marsha and Julia. Um, and this has been a great experience. I'm a painter from Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. And I do painting, installation, uh, and also drawing, uh, and teach at the University of Minnesota in the art department, where I teach drawing and painting. Uh, and I'm happy to be here today. So this is a, an interesting integration into the art sci art community in that, <clears throat> excuse me, many people are working um, with bio art, or uh, I've often wondered how I fit in with that since I'm a painter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so one of the things about my work is that it has a playful quality to it. Um, some people say that it reminds them of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so 
there is a playful quality to it, but it comes from a very, very uh, deep place, a place of maybe wonder, a place of um, kind of profound experience. So um, what is life is really the question that I grapple with in my art practice. Um, I held my father's hand when he took his last breath um, and felt his heartbeat pass away. So I was there at that moment of the passing of life. And really what happened was it really heightened my sense of the pulse of life. Um, that sense of a moment where you are in that place of recognizing what is that feeling that we take for granted of what the major things are that, that really create life. Um, it was actually a beautiful experience. It wasn't sad. I felt like I had a metaphysical experience. Um, and this experience really lingers with me. It never left. And it's informed my work for the last 20 years. <clears throat> At this point, when my father first passed away, my work was, was black. I did these giant charcoal drawings that were about 10 feet uh, you know, across. They were huge. And they really had to do with um, life coming into form or losing form. Um, and so over the years, it's, the work has really changed in terms of investigating what is life. Um, in particular, what constitutes life now is really elusive um, because of uh, the field of synthetic biology. I love the view that you have on your screen. So it's this idea of um, with synthetic biology, it questions the idea of what is life in terms of just being able to engineer organisms and engineer um, the pulse, all of that is really being explored in my work. Um, so I explore kind of the paradigm shift where I'm creating paintings that, where I'm contemplating that notion of what is life now. Um, and so I'm working with the idea of artificial life, which I'm calling the new natural. Um, and so uh, my biological paintings can be viewed as macroscopic, uh, internal, bodily, uh, could be, intestines, it could be heart pulse, it could be blood vessels, um, or mac microscopic. So they could be organisms that are like growing from primordial soup. Um, but they're synthetic organisms that are probably growing from primordial soup. Um, so when I'm engaged in the painting process, I become like a scientist. So uh, I'm observing and creating these life forms as I'm creating them. And the forms in my paintings uh, really grow in my imagination and I'm in the space of observing them and creating them at the same time as they're growing. And I used, uh, you'll notice the tension between kind of an organic quality and then a more controlled quality with these striped areas. So I used this kind of controlled, um, way of working and then improvisational ways of working um, with gouache and ink where I render these tubular forms, the striped tubular forms, they're kind of jetting out of this primordial soup. And so these kinds of the words really dictate the process and the way that I use materials. Like the fact that I say primordial, what that envisions for me is this kind of um, irregular uh, ink, that I do that I orchestrate as a living form that comes into being through moving it and drawing it and, uh, and then adding these kind of striped forms is more controlled and it becomes kind of like a uh, regulated experiment like one would develop in a lab. Um, and then as I'm working, I'm envisioning these otherworldly life forms that exist in an environment with their own with uh, their own laws of physics, and I'm inspired by beautiful freaks of the natural world, uh, such as fungi and microfauna, 
um, and uh, marine vertebrae. And that's where I um, am very inspired by uh, the abstract color and the imagery. Uh, those are the sources of what I look at for so many years that these kind of abstract forms reference those, hopefully. Um, but you're not quite sure what they are, but they seem kind of recognizable. And maybe it's this wonder of the, the notion of how we're creating, um, how we're learning about organisms having intelligence, um, fungi having intelligence, um, that fuels some of the work too as a kind of respect for life or wonder for life. And I'm also influenced largely by um, writers such as Ed Regis in his book, What is Life? Um, and then also naturalists like Michael McCarthy. I don't know if any of you have read The Moss Sto Snowstorm, Nature and Joy. And so I'm, I'm really inspired by both scientific writings, uh, philosophy, and also naturalists. Um, and that really informs my work as a form of research. And science fiction, imagination, um, that triggers my imagination. Writers, Jeff Vander, uh, Vandermeer, Annihilation. The imagery, the painterly imagery, the, the whole idea of like speculative evolution um, or what things might look like if they are engineered. He is so beautifully writes about that, it triggers my imagination. Um, and then also a new book, or new author, Sue Burke, wrote a book Nathan recently called Semiosis about plant life and intelligence. So when I think about all that goes into my work, I'm grabbing from both the natural world, the sciences, science fiction, and then those things kind of helped me grapple with this notion going back to the experience of my, of the pulse of my father's, um, the, the, the motion, the pulse that I felt as he was dying or passing away of that. Um, it's my way of grappling with that as an atheist, I guess. Um, so it brings me to science and it brings me to nature and it brings me to a philosophical place. Um, and so my goal is really to kind of create this sense of growth in my, my work and the sense of something being alive. Uh, so I want to thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for sharing that story. I think that really comes across through your work. Thank you. Next up, we have Adriano. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Julia, Marcia, and Tara. Uh, you did a great job. And uh, you have the patience to follow all these artists. I, that's impressive. <laughs> and uh, I'm also Guerrero in a museum here at William Mary in Virginia. And an artist uh, and a scholar, especially of Renaissance Italy. I'm from Italy. And uh, next year, I will teach here at Applied Science, uh, the application between art, science, and technology. So this exhibition is uh, really, really <laughs> interesting to me. OK, yesterday, I was trying to, to write something to say today, and uh, it was difficult for me. And, uh, Despite uh, I'm a curator, uh, I have a lot to say about other artists, but nothing about me. So I will improvise. Uh, and usually, I, when I do something, I find the motivations of my work after, so not before. I, I, did, I think it's uh, true for many artists. And um, so I was thinking uh, yesterday, what was my motivation about this new series? And uh, two things came up. So one, this uh, series was done uh, during the pandemic. So 
I went into nature, but also walking on the streets. Nobody was there. And um, I noticed that uh, everywhere uh, we look up to the sky, we see street electric wires. So I was doing photos, not to just to the clean sky, but uh, to the sky with the, the, you know, the interaction of these uh, wires. And uh, for me, it was interesting to see the contaminations that uh, we do. We are uh, modifying the landscape and we are doing uh, our artworks sometime or we are doing, we are wasting the artwork of uh, the universe. We don't know. This is difficult to, to, to say. So this is one, was one uh, idea. The other idea is more personal. I'm a, a Michelangelo scholar. So I'm uh, working on an exhibition on Michelangelo and this is in the ceiling. So uh, Michelangelo was very religious. And uh, I, in the last few years, I became more interesting, interested in the spirituality. And uh, Michelangelo thought that God was in the sky. And uh, I think it's a, a little bit also the meaning of the Sistine Ceiling frescoes. And uh, so I was thinking also the same, maybe, to look up to the sky and see something maybe new or more, uh, you know, interesting and less, uh, because uh, if you see, we, every day we are uh, with our head looking uh, downward, uh, working uh, on our, uh, you know, iPhones, whatever. Instead, we should look up and uh, see what is up and uh, discover something new. That's it. Well, for an explanation that um, you were just going off the cuff here, I'd say that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that we can see that in your work. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And next up we have Michelle. Hello. Um, so thank you to Julia, Marsha and Tara for assembling this fascinating exhibition. And I'm truly thankful to be part of it. Um, I am an artist and an animator living in Los Angeles. And this is a project that in large part is about family history and uh, home. As I grew up and grew older, I became more and more aware of the many complications and traumas that can be contained in domestic space um, through the accumulated experiences of my family and my friends. And most impactfully, a devastating secret that was held by a member of my own family. Once it came to light, it caused a fundamental shift in my conception of us, of what it means to be home or at home, and introduced a core conflict that I still find hard to reconcile. How do you love someone and yet be horrified by them at the same time? Old memories now exist in opposition to new knowledge and we, we can't unlearn a secret. So I thought about the idea of the uncanny as a way to communicate the feelings I was having the feeling that the familiar had become unfamiliar. Um, to quote David Krell, the uncanny will in fact be the most familiar. It will be the skeleton in the closet of every home, of the most closely closeted closet in the homiest home there ever was. Um, at the same time, I was wary of illustrating trauma too directly, um, worried about being sentimental or invasive or sensational. Um, my own experience of events was partly that of witness and partly that of the loss and confusion that results when memories are contaminated by new knowledge. Uh, Susan Seward in her book on longing talks about the dollhouse um, as a materialized secret. The dollhouse is a house within a house. It articulates the tension between the inner and the outer spheres um, despite their smallness. Cognitively, the dollhouse is gigantic, so they carry quite a lot of meaning. 
I wanted to leverage that inherent contradiction. So I built miniatures of domestic objects, uh, quite literally dollhouse furniture, that I thought could become proxies for bodies or for my memories that could represent the personal stories I wanted to tell, but in a less overt fashion. I took a week-long trip out to Death Valley to source the background plates for my work. Um, having done some formative growing up years in the Southwest, the desert is a landscape that is very important to me. It's a space of long time or arrested time. Change happens very slowly. I shot the miniatures um, separately in outdoor lighting and from a vantage point that mimicked as best I could the conditions under which the original desert landscapes were photographed. And then I used compositing and um, digital manipulation techniques to situate those miniatures in the landscapes um, as if they were there, but they are truly fabrications. And I will say the composite work is not perfect and it wasn't intended to be. Um, I liked the idea that there could be a first and second read. So perhaps at first you might accept that those objects really exist in that space. But then the more you look upon inspection, the image would start to feel less and less right. Um, like it might irritate or prick your brain uh, as you try to resolve some kind of visual conflict, thereby evoking the uncanny. Scaling up an identifiably miniature object to human size and a gigantic landscape uh, became a way for me to explore that condition of simultaneous but conflicting states of being. An oscillation of sorts between the interior and exterior, uh, presence and absence, coziness and dread. And by placing these tiny replicas of domestic objects in a formidable environment, I am turning my insides out. I am externalizing my secrets into a psychological dream landscape. Thank you, Michelle. Let's see here. Next up, we have Ryan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm an artist based in London. Uh, came from Jersey in 2010, moved to London, and uh, I've been practicing in my studio ever since then. Uh, this painting uh, was created as a, a narrative painting. A lot, a lot of my paintings, uh, I try to pose a question uh, or create a discussion in order to think of possible ways of changing a way of thought in respect to maybe how we live our lives. Uh, this painting here uh, was in response to the original question posed about self, uh, how we are contained in ourselves with technology all around us. Seemingly more and more technology daily, the advancements are rapid, but we're seemingly quite at home with that. And this piece was produced before lockdown and I see the narrative as having changed since. Uh, at the time, I was feeling restricted by technology, as in, as an artist, I wanted to be able to produce work and show it. A lot of avenues were through the technological side of showing art. And of course, this, this was produced before lockdown. And during the pandemic, as we're all aware, the, the technology changed, how we utilize technology changed, how we showed, exhibited, uh, 
built connections. It became the order of uh, the intertwining probably went up threefold, maybe more of us with the technology, especially screen technology. Uh, the initial question was, can we find ways of breaking free from that sort of world of screens? Uh, maybe that was naive at the time. Uh, post lockdown, I think it's very hard to. And <laughs> a prime example is what we're doing right now. But it is viewed, I view it as a, I think it's a brilliant resource because it connects people. But I also see the flip side of it with the technology and the screen time is that it can, it can be abused, manipulated and effectively used to control people in ways that we hadn't really, well, I guess we had conceived it before with the use of newspapers, et cetera, and the controlling of information, dissemination of information and so on. Uh, so for me, I still think of it in a way that I love it, but I also hate it. It's what we, in the UK, we call it Marmite. <laughs> you either love it or hate it. It's one of those where I would like to see it uh, advancements and the rapid growth, the rapid change of society due to technological advancements to be controlled a bit more or monitored a bit more to see and to be sure that we're not moving too quickly uh, in the right or wrong directions. Uh, it's difficult for me to obviously draw any conclusions from this uh, because it's the discussion that I want and it's the narrative that I want people to add to so I can understand how they feel about it. Um, it's my understanding that we're quite happy to go along with it because post or during the pandemic, it enabled us to continue working and to continue having our normal lives. So technology was great for that. But the question is, is how much further will it go and do we need to pull back from it now? I think those are those are good questions to be thinking about. And I, I think that's on a lot of people's minds. You know, you you bring up this this event that we're doing right here, right? Uh, we used to do this event in person um, and there were a lot of benefits to that uh, that I need not get into because they're obvious. Uh, we all know in-person things are nice. It's good to see people in person. Um, however, uh, we experienced a real silver lining uh, with having to switch to online events um, with our ability to include participants and audience members um, who were outside of our geography. And that came to be uh, very meaningful and important to us. And so uh, we as an organization right now are trying to navigate as many are, um, how much of our online programming to keep and how much of it to bring back in person uh, so that we don't start, you know, all of a sudden excluding, you know, an audience that we've been engaging with for two years online, but um, we're only in a few places in the United States, right? Uh, and so uh, it doesn't make sense to lose what we have gained, um, but, uh, but do we really want, all want to sit in front of our computers all the time? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, so your piece has us thinking about all of that. Thank you, Ryan. Next up, we have Heidi. Julia, could could I go next? I mean, could we change the order for? Sure. Yeah, I can skip over you for now. Come back to you later. That would be great. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. 
Daria. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, hi, Julia. Hi, Tara. Good to see you guys even on the computer. Uh, thank you both uh, for organizing this. And of course, thank you, Marsha. It was nice to meet you even via the screen. So um, I'm going to be briefly talking about uh, this installation that I created um, in 2019, right before the pandemic, kind of, uh, so that the installation was exploring this idea of collaboration between human and non-human agents. And um, the uh, collaboration, I thought, what would be the language of collaboration? I'm always interested in that, how we can communicate with non-human agent, uh, specifically fungi in my place, um, about um, how to understand this language. And I thought, because language collaboration requires, in my understanding, consent. So I thought that care is could be the ultimate language, um, the understanding of the care and caring for the um, organisms we are working with. And um, so I uh, basically uh, created this uh, interactive installation where uh, I seeded this petri dishes with uh, mycelium. And inside of the petri dishes, I actually uh, laser etched the sites where I collected the mycelium from. And then um, I uh, laser etched as well the mycelium network on this copper plate that became like this, um, uh, that hosts hosted uh, by um, a um, transducer that was emanating the sine wave of 220 hertz. And um, I did the research about um, uh, effects of the different vibrations on uh, living organisms. And I found out that the 220 specifically helps the organisms to grow stronger. So the idea was the audience to interact and um, move these dishes and trying to figure out where their this no, uh, sound is coming from. So the petri dishes act as the amplifiers. And so this noise was only coming from during the gallery hours. And with, um, the gallery, uh, when the gallery was closed, everything was quiet. So what's interesting that happened during the next two weeks, um, well, first of all, my petri dishes got contaminated with a very common green mold, which I thought was kind of fantastic because I'm always uh, interested in this clash of different landscapes and networks. Um, and uh, so, and the circles were created. Uh, and if we go back to the previous slide real quickly to the very first one, uh, the three dishes that were moved around, um, uh, they created, the, the circles were created by the mold uh, growing inside. And the central dish was my control. It didn't really, it wasn't moved except like the first day. And that's why you see a little bit of some kind of pattern. But to me, this was an interesting outcome. And I work a lot in this notion of creating these experiments, trying to figure out how the living organisms uh, will behave and um, to certain stimuli, and also what kind of networks uh, as us humans can create together uh, with, um, uh, with the organisms that we are constantly interacting with. So this installation um, also contained um, other works that is, are not shown in the show, but um, it was an interesting experiment. And of course, I uh, nowadays it will be hard to recreate this because of some of the COVID restrictions, but as you can see, people were able to put their ears and move the dishes around and trying to figure out uh, where the stimuli, the noise um, is coming from. Uh, so I um, skipped my introduction to put it to the uh, last minute. So I am um, an artist and educator. I work in the intersection of um, art and science. And currently I'm working at the Air Force Academy. I'm teaching art and science collaboration, sustainable art practices and photography. So my work a lot uh, is about uh, based on notion of care and what does it mean um, for us to collaborate and what kind of like the landscapes, what kind of networks, what kind of intersections we can create that can help us to build a relationship uh, towards more greener, towards greener future. Uh, so I think uh, this is it for my part of the talk. Um, again, thank you so much for including me uh, into this fantastic um, uh, show. It's like the first show of this year that I'm participating in. So thank you so much.
Thank you, Daria. We're so glad to have your work in the show. And yes, uh, 2022, it's going to be better than 2021 and 2020 for that matter, <laughs> we for, for art exhibitions for sure. Um, next up, we have Ibuki. Hi, my name is Ibuki. Uh, thank you for including my work and this this is a great honor to have a show with great artists at the New York Hall of Science. I was born in Japan and now I based in Los Angeles. My practice incorporates performance art, video art, installation and is deeply rooted in the body, Japanese buto dance, metamorphosis and the cyborg feminism. So these digital paintings are all derived from my Buto dance movement. Uh, Buto dance is a Japanese modern dance form that emerged after World War II and founded on unknown principles of philosophy, subconsciousness, primal instincts, and ancient and unexplained myths. So when I create a digital piece, I capture my movement and combine different parts of my body to create it. So this piece was created in the middle of the 2020 pandemic. So both of them process of uh, uh, process the experience of being cut off from physical connection from, with people due to the pandemic as they are no longer able to go outside. So both works are rooted in these two themes, uh, the fear of losing one's physicality and the new physicality that is created through digital media. So also during the pandemic 2020, I filmed my own body and dance and published my daily physicality as video art and digital art on the internet like a diary. So these experiences tended to be quite different from the physicality I had experienced before. So this is because my physicality as it emerges digitally exists beyond space, time and the actual shape of my body. So this work representation expresses the uh, materialized body and the other piece subconsciousness represents the uh, the mo moment when we body ex uh, processes a uh, visceral surface and the body screams out through the digital screen as a physical body. So the exhibition scene, the concept of the boundary between inside and outside and uh, my work are uh, connected in the point of uh, digital gadgets digital space and the new physicality that exists and emerges in our everyday perception of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Buki. And next up we have Susan. Susan, you are on mute. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I wanna I, I wanna express my delight in being part of this show, and thanks to uh, Tara, Marsha, and Julia for including me. Um, I am a Connecticut-based artist. I'm a painter, a public artist, and a core writer for the international blog Artists and Climate Change. For almost uh, five years, I've written a monthly series about artists, exhibitions, and projects all over the world, also focused on water and climate change. And all of my own work since 2011 has focused on water issues in the context of climate change. Most recently, I completed a three-month artist residency at Planet Labs, a satellite imaging company based in California where I collaborated with a geologist and studied the proliferation of sinkholes occurring around the Dead Sea in Israel and Jordan and in Siberia as a result of climate change and created a, a large series of mixed media paintings on paper combining data and my response to the satellite images. 
However, at the beginning of the pandemic, before vaccines allowed us some measure of relief, I took a break from my usual work and began a series of 40 photographs, which addressed how we were forced to separate ourselves from others inside in order to escape the virus outside, which was invisible, soundless, and deadly. I used a window as a literal separation between the inside and the outside. Uh, the window became the safe way for us to see the world without touching it, to see outside without being outside. It was also a vehicle to reflect our inside world out. Uh, each of the photographs in this series portrays a window uh, upon which segments of my own paintings have been reflected. In some cases, the windows in the picture plane is a tiny rectangle of light that seems very far away to emphasize the isolation we were enduring. In others, the window has absorbed the colors of the image being reflected and been transformed. Somewhat out of focus and jarring, the photographs exude a sense of nostalgia, loneliness, and longing. They are interior landscapes that look out through windows onto the barely visible exterior. In the first of my two photographs in the exhibition, the painting's reflection has colored the window red, creating an out of focus screen-like effect over a portion of the window frame and placed a ghost-like chair in the existing room's interior. The image suggests that we always see the exterior world through the lens of our own interior lives. We color it with our feelings, create scenarios where none exist and gloss over reality. In the second photograph, a large decorative chair and oriental rug seem as if they're suspended from the ceiling over a floor filled with debris reaching almost to the top of the actual window sills. The skewed image is disturbing. The interior landscape does not make sense. In this instance, the exterior world seems like an unlikely means of escape. There's another meaning that these photographs suggest by joining reflections of my own paintings with images of my windows, I'm providing a window into my own interior landscape, the way I see the world amidst all this global chaos. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm gonna skip back now to Heidi's images, if you are good to go, Heidi. Yes. Sorry for that. Um, no problem. I will explain. Uh, first, thank you, Julia and Tara and Marsha uh, for the wonderful exhibition. I have seen it in person and it's very impressive and I would suggest everybody to go there. It's really nice. Also the uh, museum is very impressive. I have never been there before and I really liked it. Um, and thank you for inviting me to the talk and sorry for this skipping situation that has to do with something I will explain in a moment. So my name is Heidi Hartry, I live in New York and my work is very material oriented. So I love this title, Landscapes of Material and Mind, how fantastic. I always you, uh, work in unusual material of the waste, for example, waste from the slaughterhouse or with rust and oil and tar and road skill and roadkill and all sorts of debris. And um, my most recent project's material was also unusual. I make portraits of cre uh, portraits of dead people from cremated ashes, and the cremated ashes is from the subjects which are depicted. Um, the work in the exhibition here is from the series Not a Rose. These are flowers made from waste products from the slaughterhouse. The one you see now is, um, is rabbit ears. They are dyed with red beet and heads of fetal mice and eyelashes of cows. And do you want to show the other one? 
um, that is wild boar tongues and mice tails in a, um, what is it called? Um, artichoke. Artichoke, sorry. It's okay. okay. And now to the problem, because I had not um, prepared talking about this project because it's already a little older project and there's so much said and written about it. And I felt rather to respond to Tara's ideas about the exhibition because I found it so interesting. And I thought if somebody wants to learn more about this flower project, um, you can go to my website, heidehartree.com. There's a, uh, there's a one project which is called Not a Rose. And um, there was also a wonderful video, which I really love, made by London Consortium TV. And they documented the uh, making process and included many contributors who have contributed to the book I made, which is a documentation of that project. So there's just so much that I thought that was not so interesting talking about that, but um, about this kind of uh, notion of boundaries between the interior and the exterior that they permeate. And um, the construct of separateness, I find that very interesting. And because I have kind of written more about uh, um, historical and philosophical things, I had to delete it and had to change it a little bit. So that is the reason why I do something else and why it took a little longer. And I hope it I will be done in five minutes, nevertheless. Um, so as you imply, Tara, in your curatorial statement, interior and exterior are really a continuum. And it's this only convention which at the most basic level is a matter of habit, convenience, clip, evolutionary advance, or even a political distinction that in the effectively, that is then effectively ossified and valorized in language. We are subject to our own misperception to which we cling with the tendency tenacity of delusion. The safe, stable, functional, normal components and processes into which we divide the world hide its truth. And as in the ontological, so in the moral sphere, by which I mean that if we lie to ourselves about what we are, how can we tell the truth about what we ought to be? As T.S. Eliot said, humankind cannot bear very much reality. When I think about my work and its intentions, I constantly see that I've always tried to invert or rather subvert uh, the natural order. My surfaces are insides, whether literally as with the internal organs of animal which I've made to look like harmless pretty objects, or conceptually in revealing the violence or death at the heart of innocent daily life in consumer or more dramatically produce a society. Now I have to drink something. Sorry. In a way, again, rather he Hegelian, and I had before wanted to say something about Hegel. The inside is the truth of the outside, which one might equally say is more or less the conventional philosophical and later the scientific position. Surface is deceit, appearance, half-truth, comfort, the accepted and unexamined the accepted and unexamined, and the interior represents the quest, which, though it isn't for everyone, in a deeper sense is for everyone, which raises the issue of the political meaning of philosophy or simply thinking. 
In general, it is the office of the artist, the scientist, the psychologist, the philosopher, to reveal what is hidden, to get behind the surface, to understand what it means and not just how it seems. To create and to question is inscribed in our way of being. To transform might be a better way of saying it, or even to recognize that, that transformation is formation and that form is always transformed in perception, thought, language, and work. So on the one hand, in making the surface, the depth, bringing the inside out, I set the distinction between inside and outside itself in question. And on the other, perhaps in a more conventional sense, I prevail upon it, upon it uh, rely on it, um, uh, I, pr I prevail upon it for existential purposes. I turn its oblivion and commonplace usefulness into evolutionary utility upon itself. But I think I invoke in it as a, um, in, it, in the distinction between inside and outside, depth and surface, as a tool in the same way that I use Latin names or conventional still life presentations. I didn't say before what the Latin names of these um, flower uh, of these flowers are. It is not um, on the picture. Um, they they have um, titles that are in Latin, and if you translate these titles, they reveal what material from the slaughterhouse I used to make them, but the Latin title implies a Latin uh, real name of a flower. So, um, but I think I invoke it as a tool in the same way that I use Latin names or conventional still life presentation uh, and recall that the French term for still life is nature mort or dead nature. In using such expedients, I feel that I'm pointing to what is obvious in structuration. These are mere conventions of perception and understanding. They are not real. The real is a continuum and we have made ourselves afraid of the real by so successfully denying it the continuum between inside and outside, as well as the continuum between life and death, between conventional mortality and the actual scope of the human. Ultimately, I want to embrace the interior, the system that support and are the deeper meaning of our animal and social lives as part of our normal awareness, as something not divided from surface and language, though it requires a moment of shock and one might say of transition to arrive there. But then recognizing our oblivion is always shocking. In a way, it's the essential principle of horror, that the horrifying actually exists all the time, though we choose not to look up in it, and in not wanting, we in effect deny it. Therefore, the moment we actually see a reality may be deeply disconcerting, though we can be elating or liberating as well, perhaps both, which could provide one understanding of the notion of the sublime. Our own exterior is affected, it breaks down. Art conventions have over millennia made the effort of the artist to expose reality, you could just as easily say depict more, more difficult because we assimilate everything too ready, readily into our pre-existing understandings. It's not easy to dis dislocate our ordinary ways of ingesting the world and art therefore can seem to be complicit in the political denial of the horror of the inside. But as with the basic truth in general, it also may not require more than a slight, perhaps imperceptible change of perspective to encounter it again. And yes, equally to lose sight of it again. When I'm making the art that most reflects my thinking, the difference between reality and appearance, 
that it embodies is so slight, so momentary, that it can easily be missed or mistaken for literality that conflates it entirely. Its fear of operation is a racist edge or a perme permeable membrane. Thank you so much, Heidi. Let me just flip back to your other image for a moment. And I believe that brings us to the end. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to all of our artists for sharing um, your work with us and the thoughts behind your work. I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Um, we do have some time for questions and we do already have some questions in the Q&A box. So I will read them aloud on behalf of our audience members. If you are out there and you have a question for one of the artists or any of the artists or all of the artists, please type it in the um, Q&A box now. So our first question is for Adriano. Um, this question comes from Aaron. Aaron asks Adriano, um, since you are a Michelangelo scholar, I'm curious how you think Michelangelo would have um, thought about the contemporary portrayals of landscape both in this exhibition and any others that might be relevant. So, I don't know. Uh, but uh, this is a, a question that uh, many people ask me, uh, especially they ask me uh, with the technology that artists have today, computers, virtual uh, reality, et cetera. What do you, they ask me, what do you think Michelangelo will do? So I don't know that. Uh, um, I think that uh, what uh, motivates Michelangelo was really uh, to be a kind of an ambassador of God. He was very religious. So today, I don't know what would motivate him. So it's not about, I think, technology. It's about motivations. But I don't know the answer. That's a tough question, but it's it's fun to think about, as I'm sure you do all the time. Um, and we have a question for Susan. Um, this is again from Aaron. Uh, he says, for Susan, I'm struck by your comment that the windows provided a view into your interior landscape amidst the global chaos outside. In many 19th century illustrations and paintings of landscape, the view is outward through a window or other frame to a peaceful pastoral. What do you think has caused the major shift over the last 150 years in our concept of the landscape out there to shift it from the pastoral to the chaotic? You're on mute again. There you go. I think, I think there are a, new, a number of answers to that question. I'll, I'll attempt a few. Um, the first one is that the world is more chaotic. Uh, and artists are reflecting, you know, what, you know, what they're experiencing uh, in the world. Um, I don't think we have um, a, an idealistic um, view of the landscape that that 19th century artists did, partly because we don't have the same um the same kind of relationship with nature that the 19th century world did um, our lives have become very separate um, from nature which is um partly uh due um uh partly due to how we have uh, what we have done to the environment um uh, in many ways, the environment now is striking back at what we have done. And so um, I think we are experiencing, you know, increased floods and 
stronger storms and the kinds of landscape we're experiencing is quite different than in the 19th century. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, that's that's to say the least, right? <laughs> uh, Ryan sees snow out his window. Um, I don't have snow here, but I do have clouds. No. Um, are there any other questions out there? I just want to give a last last chance for any audience members who didn't get a chance to type in yet. Um, oh, we do have. Uh, Another question from Marius, um, and this is, uh, appears to be directed towards any artist who would like to answer. How much have the current conditions changed your practice? Now, I don't know what Marius means by current conditions, um, but we could take that a number of ways. Um, could be COVID related, could be, um, sure, I'm sure it could be politically related, um, could be uh, condi other conditions which have changed your life. <laughs> um, so if anybody, I know uh, we heard from Susan already how, how you uh, started to make a different type, you know, you made this whole new series uh, that was really different for you, but maybe some of that will work its way into, you know, the, the more regular work that you make. Uh, was anyone else, did anyone else have a major uh, shift at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of what types of work they were making? I could talk about just when the um, participant mentioned the current situation, um, if I could take that into glo just global warming, which isn't current, but it's certainly more, more in the news now than it ever has been. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Is the idea that I think a lot of artists, when they portray um, global warming, environmental concerns, it's a kind of about a, a a political statement that talks about the devastation. Um, and I would like to refer um, to Michael McCarthy's Moth Snowstorm, Nature and Joy, that with my work, I'm trying to portray the kind of wonder and amazement of noticing the natural world as we have it now, um, in that we're trying to be in the moment with what we have now as opposed to um, thinking about the devastation, but also taking time to notice the beauty, the um, amazement of the natural world and to honor it while we still have species that are here and taking a walk in the woods, like waking us up to, we're so separate from nature in our day-to-day -day life, most of us, waking us up to the fact that it's now or never, get out there and see it and be with it and enjoy the beauty and the wonder um, before it's gone. So, I mean, I think his book talks about that. He, he travels all over the world and visits um, environments where he grew up or where he's visited you know, 30 years ago and talks about the change, but then he talks about what he sees and what it was like. Um, so that's, I think, um, something that's changed for me is the feeling of um, almost a kind of urgency to go and experience the natural world before certain parts are devastated. Um, so that's kind of a take that I think is a shift for me and for my work. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. If you wouldn't mind um, writing that uh, book and author down in the chat and sharing with everybody, I'm sure there are some interesting- It's been articles. written about and lots of people have interviewed him. Um, yeah, I'd love to, sure. Great, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share of this vein, um, how a current condition has changed your practice? Uh, I could say that the current conditions have informed my practice. Um, uh, I don't know about changed. I just, I just get more and more um, agitated by the lack of, of action, you know, to combat climate change and the climate crisis. And that's reflected in the, the kind of work that I'm doing. But I, I'd also like to say, you know, to, to Laura that there is a lot of beauty in the devastation as well, which is an ironic contradiction. Um, 
to you know what is happening to the environment. Thank you, Susan. Yes, it's a hard thing to not uh, be agitated about, um, certainly when your work centers around these themes. Were you going to say something, Michelle? Oh, yeah, just um, kind of in response to like, pandemic conditions, because my work has been about home and this project all dates from before the pandemic. I think when the pandemic started and then I was literally trapped in my home for uh, months. Um, I, you know, I started a new body of work that's really about that sort of feeling of isolation or, or um, that was direct, you know, it's just a direct response. And it was also kind of a function of what I could do, given that I didn't have access to my studio, what could I make, you know, on the card table in the back of my extra bedroom. Um, so the work became kind of small and contained and about being small and contained all at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people uh, had a similar experience to you. How can I, how can I be smaller but have my ideas still be big? Um, so I wanted to share. I'm sharing in the chat uh, now a link to our next event. It actually involves some of the themes that we've been talking about today, uh, largely climate. Um, so our next event is on April 28th. It is also a virtual event. This is part of our laser series, which is a cross-disciplinary um, talk series that we put on in collaboration with Swissnex in Boston and New York um, under the umbrella of the nonprofit Leonardo. Um, our next laser is called Climate Visions. And uh, here's a little spiel about it. Presenting accurate data on climate change is proving inadequate to spur widespread grassroots action. This edition of Laser Boston will explore how data paired with powerful visuals and art can provide a more visceral reaction to the climate crisis than data alone. We have four really fantastic speakers lined up. Um, it's free to attend. It's a Zoom uh, webinar as this is. It will also be recorded in case you're unable to attend, but please do check out that link I dropped in the chat um, if you are interested to learn more and register. And of course, feel free to share with whomever. Uh, so we are uh, just at about 2.30 here. So we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to thank all of the artists for taking the time today to uh, tell us a bit more about what's behind your wonderful work in this exhibition. A reminder, uh, this is a live in real life exhibit. It's our first in a long time. Um, so if you're in the New York area, please do drive or hop on the seven train over to New York Hall of Science. It's a wonderful place, especially if you have a family um, to bring your family there on Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. Um, up through April 24th. Uh, thank you again to Tara for doing such a great job getting this group of artists together. It's uh, always so fun for me to see um, a curator go forward with a vision and, and see what they come up with. Uh, and a huge thank you to Marsha for being our partner in this exhibit and really making this happen. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will share the recording of this uh, talk next week on our social media and via email. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was great seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. <laughs>